July was by far the busiest month yet since starting this series where I document my favorite matches and moments over the course of a calendar year. There's a lot of ground to cover this month, so let's get right into it with some terms and conditions as to how I go about doing this. First, it's obvious I will not have seen every single match to take place. Time and money are finite things, and I have some major blind spots compared to others' channel, blogs, or podcasts. The great part is if there's something I haven't seen that you have, I'd love to hear your recommendations so I can add them to a separate watch list to continue the discussion. Second, favorite and best are different things, and my favorite matches may differ from, say, something critically acclaimed by Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which is a key one this month. It's not a top tens or a hidden gems type thing either. My selection of matches is simply based on my own personal enjoyment and what I found interesting, rather than anything like star ratings, cage match ratings, business metrics, etc. And last but not least, spoiler warning for match finishes. By the numbers, I watched 402 matches spanning 17 promotions. Here are a few of my favorites from July of 2023. We begin with the main event from the Glate second anniversary show, a Ledet UWF championship match. Glate has acted as my introduction to shoot style with their UWF division, and this particular match may have been my favorite yet. Takanori Ito enters as the first Ledet UWF champion after winning a tournament in June. His opponent in Fujita Jr. Hayato is in his second stint in professional wrestling after overcoming cancer in addition to some derailing injuries. It's incredible to see him performing at this level taking all of that into account. While I'm no shoot style expert, I can at least offer my perspective as to why this may appeal to you if you've maybe never given anything like this a shot. UWF rules lean more into shoot sensibilities than standard pro wrestling, with a point system for rope breaks, takedowns, and so on. There's no pinfalls either, you must win by either submission, knockout, or on total points at the time limit. You expect a sort of chess match due to this, and while you do get some of those intricacies in the grappling, this match is incredibly fluid and engaging for its relatively short 9 minute runtime. All the action is crisp, from the mat work to the furious strike exchanges. The point system allows for something like a suplex to feel like a huge deal, which is a pretty cool change of pace from your usual pro wrestling presentation. Hayato is on the back foot for most of this match, though is able to fight his way out of the corner late and mount the comeback at just one point remaining, winning with a guillotine. The pro wrestling aspect comes into play here to allow this kind of comeback to unfold, and I think it's all the better for it. A criticism I read about this match was that Hayato was winning with the hold that he couldn't apply successfully in the beginning of the match despite so many attempts. I think after slugging it out for nearly 10 minutes it'd be more plausible to catch your opponent with his defenses down, but that's just my take. Regardless, you can find this one for free right here on YouTube. It's pretty short and straight to the point, but a really cool match, and a nice moment to see Hayato win in this setting. As always when discussing deathmatch, I have timestamps in the description if it's not your thing. Fans of extreme violence can take your pick between the John Moxley El Desperado final deathmatch from July 5th or the preview tag from the night before. Both were great, though for variety's sake I wanted to take a look at the tag match. This lineup was right out of a fantasy booking, let alone taking place in the main event slot of a New Japan show. There's an oddly endearing aspect to Jun Kasai's deathmatches, and this one is no different. The tone is set immediately as Cork and Hall comes unglued for his entrance, as both teams break into a building-wide brawl. If it's possible to have a violent deathmatch hosted in a party match atmosphere, this is it. Moxley and Kasai's interactions anchor the match, while Homicide and Desperado hold their end of the bargain. While the singles match takes its time to incorporate the plunder, this one gets to it right away with an entire yard sales worth of weapons at their disposal. You get the signature Kasai family inventions, leading to some imagery that will sear into your memory like a backdrop into a bed of forks. Amongst all the carnage, things would begin to resemble a tag team wrestling match. This section finds a way to incorporate an El Desperado hot tag, which, given the chaos that took place prior, is actually impressive. He had great chemistry with everyone in this match. A pair of pinche locos including one into a trash can would secure the victory and the momentum heading into final death. These types of scenarios are testament to how versatile El Desperado can be. Be it technical wrestling, brawling, or over-the-top violence, he can do it all. The three-quarter mask look also allows him to get color without having to tear it in the preview tag, which is a nice touch as well. I'm glad to have the chance to talk about him in this series, as to my recollection I haven't yet. That being said, this match rocks. You couldn't ask for much more out of this group of maniacs. Similarly to the main event of Supercard of Honor, there are those much more qualified than I am to talk about this match. Check out Joseph Monticilio's breakdown of this series of matches for a wonderful in-depth analysis. 
Regardless, I absolutely loved what this had to offer, and there's plenty that I got out of this match from my own personal experience. I really appreciate how different the three Athena Willow matches are. They tell the story of Willow's growing strength and confidence in the face of an indomitable force. I really enjoyed the Owen Hart tournament match as it showed that Willow was much closer to even footing despite just scraping by with the victory. It created that anticipation that maybe this would finally be her moment. And then it wasn't. The third iteration was the epic of the trilogy, and rightfully so as it was main eventing the Death Before Dishonor pay-per-view. I liked the dynamic of Athena wanting to get her win back despite still being champion. It reinforced this nasty edge she's carried with her in her ROH run. The goal remains unchanged for Willow, she has to definitively beat Athena and finally claim the ROH Women's World Championship. Never more have these two felt more like equals, resulting in a match where a lot of massive offense is traded, leaving me on the edge of my seat for its 20 minute runtime. They throw everything they have at each other, including callbacks to those that came before them. I can see how this cooled off the match just a little bit, but it wasn't enough to take me out of it personally. Expending this much offense leads to a finishing stretch on a nice edge. In a sick twist of fate, Athena is able to utilize her environment to set up another O-face, so she forgoes the pinfall to incapacitate Willow with a crossface. I watch Honor Club every single week, yes, some of us actually exist. And even if I cherry pick matches on a given week, I never skip an Athena match. In her catalog of squash matches this year, she's been exploring different ways to win, to put it lightly, be it the O-Face, incorporating submissions, or even by knockout. She's been expanding her arsenal on screen, and this finish was a nice payoff in a sense, even if it wasn't the payoff that we wanted. Previously in this series, I've talked about how a match can purposely leave you feeling disappointed, rather than feeling flat or empty. Just like the main event of Supercard of Honor, this is one of those matches, and it's not an easy thing to pull off. This main event was spectacular, and probably my favorite of their stellar trilogy. I'm a sucker for spectacle, especially when it's a feud or a wrestler that I'm invested in, and the big match feeling here amplified the action for me in a positive way. Even in defeat, Willow continues her rise, and if the ROH Women's World title is not meant to be, there are some other accolades that would be fitting for her. tournament season in Japan rages on with the beginning of Stardom's Round Robin Tournament, the 5 Star Grand Prix. The first time encounter between Shuri and Suzu Suzuki was a marquee matchup on a loaded opening night that was sure to deliver violence, and did it ever. Suzu is one of the brightest young wrestlers in the entire industry who has proven that she is not afraid to take risks with her background in deathmatch. Her game plan is to immediately overload Shuri, hitting her tequila shot finisher before the bell even rings. She continues to stay aggressive on the veteran dumping her onto the ramp with a suplex and even hitting her with her signature German off of the apron and all the way onto the floor. It's a sound plan, though Shuri is an extremely dangerous individual in her own right, with years of experience on her side as well. Once it gets back into the ring, Suzu throws everything she can at Shuri, even going blow to blow with her. It's a bold approach to take against someone with an MMA background. It's Shuri's acumen on the mat that is able to swing things into her favor with an extended sleeper hold sequence. Shuri has to rely on her super finisher, the Shu Sakai, to put away Suzu, and I think that's a nice way to convey that she's a legitimate threat amongst Stardom's main event scene. Losing to what is essentially Stardom's final boss, using an extremely protected move, is nothing to be ashamed of. I think it'll go a long way for Suzuki in this tournament. I absolutely love this match, though it's certainly not perfect. I thought the double down spot looked unconvincing and there's a lot of kickouts in the final stretch which could bother you depending on your taste. But for how much I enjoyed everything else, it didn't ruin the match for me. These kind of bomb fests are perfect within a tournament setting, and it's not something you have to overcomplicate. The result here is a breathless fireworks display with some ridiculous bumps, and one of my favorite stardom matches of the year up to this point. This year's G1 Climax Tournament has suffered from a clash of ideals in what's been a transitional year for the company. There's an imbalance between getting the familiar faces of the last decade in each block while trying to incorporate the up-and-comers that they've worked to establish over the last eight months. The result is a tournament that simply lacked the energy and quality that made it so notorious. With four blocks of eight, you just get a lot of matches that simply happen, rather than the multiple match of the year level entries that we're used to. However, the two guest appearances in this year's tournament have delivered for the most part. Kaito Kiyomiya has arguably been the tournament's MVP through the block stages, and Eddie Kingston brought some much needed heart and soul to the table. Kingston's match with Shingo Takagi on night 2 is a sentimental favorite, delivering on all the stubborn, meathead action you could ask for. It's the ideal slugfest you'd want out of a G1 card, though it was his rematch with Tomohiro Ishii that was my favorite of the tournament up to this point. 
Quick disclaimer, I will be using some photos from their previous meetings for reasons. I expected another knockdown drag out fight between Kingston and Ishii and while the match is clearly rooted in that style, I mean just given who's in it, the selling of the two men gives us a much more human element that pushes it over the top for me. Kingston enters Cork and Hall carrying injuries from his prior block matches and they are aggravated more and more throughout. You could easily just have them knock seven shades into each other until someone can't get up, though Eddie really gets the most out of these strike exchanges because of this. His knees buckle, his back gives out, he's screaming out in agony at times, and the crowd is absolutely with him through all of it. Corkin at a fever pitch provides the atmosphere that truly makes this feel like the G1, and the escalation and urgency in the ring complements that perfectly. That isn't something I can say for the rest of this tournament. It's no secret that Eddie has a great deal of reverence for Japanese wrestling, as well as this famous venue, and he made good by leaving it all out there in the ring on this night. To little surprise, the Stone Pitbull holds up his end as well. It's Ishii in the G1, where he's bound to thrive. He's always been great at balancing his stoic demeanor with some of the strongest selling around, and that pairs excellently with Kingston's emotional performance. He also torpedoes himself head first into Eddie on his way to victory, which flat out rocks. I'm happy to see Eddie Kingston's success in New Japan, as he received some bizarre criticism from Western fans, like the claim that he doesn't deserve to be there, or strange fixations on his physique or conditioning. The reality is that New Japan wouldn't put a championship on the guy if they didn't see his value, and I think the feedback from these crowds alone speaks for itself. Eddie helped deliver a genuine G1 epic in a year where they've been extremely hard to come by. A very pleasant surprise to round out this month. This match wasn't advertised ahead of the July 31st episode of Raw, as with most Gunter matches they're sorted out in backstage segments. This time it happened to be against someone I've wanted to see Gunter paired with since his arrival on the main roster in Chad Gable. This really couldn't have come at a better time with Alpha Academy finally catching on with crowds and turning babyface. The 5 minute challenge gimmick also provides a way to legitimize Gable with a technical victory without having to pin or submit the Intercontinental Champion. In execution, it's really just a matter of letting the wrestlers have a wrestling match, finding organic success in an environment that normally wouldn't promote such a thing. This isn't a blind dunk on WWE either, it's simply how they structure their television matches most of the time. The crowd was relatively dead at the opening bell, though Gable was able to slowly win them over as a sympathetic babyface. They're able to make something like a test of strength feel exciting, with a game of cat and mouse based around the time limit. Gunther is very dismissive here, and shows more arrogance compared to his usually dialed in demeanor. It's a simple yet effective approach to get one over on him, and out of frustration he restarts the match. This is where the bombastic offense you'd associate with a Gunther match kicks in. Gable can dish out strikes in his own right, but I really enjoyed the selling of Gunther's chops in the corner where he just collapses into a heap. Gable's fiery comeback gets the crowd on their feet, as he's able to return some targeted offense onto Gunther's arm in an attempt to neutralize his devastating chops and lariats. You also get some of Gable's signature athleticism, like a deadlift German to really get you to believe that he could pull this off. Unfortunately it's to no avail, though Daring General was pushed way farther than expected. Most of the standout matches on Raw this year have involved Gunther, and I think moving him over from SmackDown was incredibly beneficial since there isn't a lot of wrestling happening on that show. Gable obviously made for a fantastic opponent, and it's so nice to finally see him get something more than just eating a pin or making his opponent look good. I really hope they revisit this soon, as with a little bit more time and no commercial breaks, you can have a truly great match on your hands. And before I go, here are some honorable mentions that weren't brought up in previous entries. First I wanted to touch on a few of the marquee matches on AEW Collision this month. For many, the FTR Bullet Club Gold matches would define July and are certainly worth a shout. The reason why they didn't appear in the video proper is because there's just so much of it. I was absolutely exhausted by the third fall of the highly acclaimed sequel, and between the 86 minutes of ring time between the two matches you could probably find a perfect 20-25 to 25 minute match. That isn't to discredit what they accomplished, just between all of the wrestling I watch for these videos, it's very difficult to thoroughly revisit an hour long match unless I absolutely feel the need to. The CM Punk Samoa Joe main event from July 8th was an incredibly thoughtful match that gave us enough to chew on until they revisit this feud in a pay per view program, and the WrestleMania 10 inspired finish was a wonderful nod to Owen Hart. El Lindemann, Kento Miyahara, and Chihiro Hashimoto vs Black Generation International from the Glate Anniversary Show. 
A six person tag that's just a whole lot of fun giving us one of the cooler yet unexpected combinations with Big Hosh filling in for Bandito on short notice. Gold class versus natural vibes from Dragon Gate Kobe World on July 2nd. I took July to further acclimate myself with Dragon Gate between Kobe World and the King of Gate tournament and this triangle gate match is everything I expected when it comes to really strong faction based tags associated with the promotion. Minora and Shimizu's chemistry makes a lot more sense in the context of where the tournament would lead both of them in weeks to come. Starlight Kid vs Nanai Takahashi from Stardom July 2nd. Another solid entry in Takahashi's series of matches to get the very best out of the younger generation through grueling physical tests. I think the work outweighs the questionable result. Katsuhiko Nakajima vs Kento Miyahara from Noah July 15th. It's rare that you see a Noah match in this day and age receive the sort of acclaim that this has, and I wanted to make note of that here. I really wanted to love this match, but it just didn't connect with me personally. That doesn't mean it wouldn't for you, so I encourage checking it out and forming your own opinion. Despite my issues with the match, I appreciate all the history folded into it, as well as the red hot crowd in Korokan Hall that night. Natsupoi vs Chihiro Hashimoto from Sendai Girls July 16th. A great David vs Goliath match as Big Hosh is one of the best monsters out there and Natsupoi provides great fire and comebacks, all within a breezy 12 minutes. Konosuke Takeshita vs Yuki Ueno from DDT July 23rd. Sloop returns to Japan with his newfound persona to decimate his former sauna club members. An emotional underdog performance from Ueno was no match for this cold, murderous iteration of Takeshita. And last but not least, Shoko Nakajima vs Riku Tatsumi from Tokyo Joshi Pro July 29th. I haven't been very high on TJPW this year, though Rika Tatsumi has been a standout, and I think she has great chemistry with Nakajima. This is once again the case in what is the best match of their cup tournament this year. And that's it for me. If you've gotten this far in the video, thank you so much for your time and for hearing what I have to say. Please do all the obligatory YouTube stuff by liking, commenting, and subscribing, and find me on the app formerly known as Twitter at OuterStevan. Let me know what your favorite match from July was in the comments below, and I'll talk to you again next time.